Welcome everyone to CBRO's June Associates meeting. I'm Mark Duggan, the Trioni Director of the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, and I'm delighted that you're able to join us for today's discussion about America's economic outlook. There was a glimmer of good news this past Friday with reports that more than 2 million jobs were added to the economy in May, and the unemployment rate fell to a little over 13%. Additionally, as of earlier today, the stock market actually closed at a level higher than its close at the end of 2019. But these really are just flickers of light in an otherwise very difficult time in our country. We know there are many Americans who are suffering and who will continue to suffer under economic inequalities and racial injustices that have been exacerbated by the COVID crisis and the associated disruption. Our scholars at CEPR are committed to understanding these problems, and it's our mission to create research and knowledge that will shape better economic policies that genuinely improve people's lives now and in the future. Thanks so much to all of you who support the work we do, and I'm hopeful that working together, we can make a difference for the better. Our two panelists today have an incredible amount of insight into the state of the economy and some thoughtful predictions about where it's headed. Jonathan Coslett is a longtime friend of ours at CEPR. He is one of our most engaged advisory board members at CEPR, and he's also very generously guest lectured in my Econ One class for several years now. Jonathan is the Chief Investment Officer of, at TPG Capital, Chairman of its Investment Committee, and a member of TPG Holdings Executive Committee. He also serves on the Board of Directors of the Lucille Packard Children's Hospital at Stanford, the Stanford Medicine Advisory Council, and the Hamilton Project Advisory Council. Also with us is John Taylor, a man who hardly needs any introduction in the realm of economic policy. John is one of our senior fellows at CEPR and served for a time as the director of CEPR. He's also the Marion Robert Raymond Professor of Economics at Stanford, the George P. Schultz Senior Fellow in Economics at the Hoover Institution, and director of the Stanford Introductory Economics Center. Off campus, John is known for his path-breaking research on monetary policy, which has been applied by central banks and financial market analysts around the world. John has previously served in a number of important economic policy roles, including as a member of the President's Council of Economic Advisors and as Undersecretary for International Affairs at the U.S. Treasury Department. He's still no stranger to Washington, D.C., where he frequently testifies at congressional hearings. I could spend the entire hour talking about our panelists' many accomplishments, but right now, I'll turn things over to Jonathan Coslett to get us started. If you have a question for us, you can submit it through the link you received in your registration confirmation, or simply write to us by clicking the URL that's appearing right below this video. Thanks so much again for being with us today, and the virtual floor is yours, Jonathan. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. Um, why don't we also put up the slides while we're talking? So to give a little context and wallpaper as we talk. We're living in such unprecedented times. Um, as we all know, there's now been almost 400 deaths globally and over 100,000 deaths in the United States. And most of the world's economies were completely shut down for the last several months. And more than 90% of the world's population is currently living in a country with largely a closed border. And this black swan biological crisis has now created the worst economic crisis in all of our lifetimes. And today we're gonna to talk about some of the difficult issues that are developing the US economy with Dr. Taylor. Uh, yeah, the equity markets. So we all use the stock market as a little bit of a barometer for what's going on in the economy, more than a little bit, a, a real bit of a barometer. As Mark said, it's been a wild ride. You know, we plunged into the COVID crisis in, in March, the economy shut down, stock market crashed. And fast forward to today, and the markets seem to be quite optimistic that the worst is behind us and that we're on the road to recovery. The, uh, the S&P has recovered three quarters of its March lows and is now down only about 5% from its February peak and is just above where it was December 31st. And this is a, against the backdrop of unemployment that's somewhere around 15%, maybe even 20% when you count the people who are actually looking for jobs, and one of the sharpest declines in GDP in, uh, in, in the history of, of recorded um, economic statistics. And if you look at this chart for a second, it just reminds you of prior recessions after an initial bump 
off the first trough, there has often been a second major decline in stock prices as the reality of high unemployment and uh, the vicious cycle setting in. So think about the great financial crisis where stocks were about the same place as they are today, but then ultimately declined 55% over the next six months. So what is causing the market's optimism and how do we re reconcile that optimism with the very difficult issues that are facing most households, most businesses and local governments and the possibility that the virus is still quite active in the United States. Next slide shows how I've been thinking about it um, in five different phases. The first phase was the initial shock and awe. We went through in February and through April. We saw the virus spread, shelter in place implemented and the economy shut down and financial markets plunge. On the next slide, from now until early fall, we'll be in what I call phase two, the reopening, the initial reopening of the economy state by state, activity by activity, with highly variable social distancing rules being implemented throughout the United States. The, in the late fall and early winter, we'll enter what I call phase three, which will be a period of peak uncertainty. For those of us who are old enough to remember Caddyshack, I've got the picture there of Bill, Wor Bill Murray uh, trying to capture the mole uh, in the golf course. It could be like whack-a-mole. We are gonna have to hold our breath and hope uh, and pray that the flu season uh, does not materialize into something where there's another major resurgence of COVID. And then at some point in 2020, 2021, maybe in the spring, a vaccine gets rolled out where we achieve herd, herd immunity, that's phase four. And then finally, the last phase after the virus is no longer active, confidence will return, activity levels will normalize, and then we can begin a period of more sustainable recovery. And we can start to really see some of the long-term implications of the COVID crisis. With that in mind, uh, I'm pleased to have Dr. John Taylor join us for a little bit of an interview slash discussion. Of course, you know, Dr. Taylor doesn't need any introduction. Uh, Mark gave him uh, a little bit of an introduction but he's now been teaching at Stanford for 36 years. He has more accolades and awards than, um, than, than any of us will ever accumulate in two lifetimes. So I wanna thank Dr. Taylor for being here with us today and fielding some of the questions given his incredible knowledge. Thanks, John, for being here. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, I look forward to this conversation. Okay, so let me, let me ask some questions. Again, we'll use some sort of slides for wallpaper so you can see some of the context. But let's start with where we are now. There should be a slide up. Again, I can't see it, but there should be a slide up of US GDP, long slide since 2000. And the bars look pretty, pretty small relative to what's being predicted for the second quarter that we're in right now. Um, you can see here that Goldman, just as one particular forecasts, generally a pretty good one, they expect second quarter GDP to decline by over a third on a on a quarter on quarter basis. Pretty amazing. And if you turn to the, if we turn to the next slide, um, you can see that after unbelievably low unemployment rates uh, over the last two, three, four years, we're now running at around 15% unemployment, probably over 20% with uh, the folks who actually aren't actually looking for a job, and we're at the lowest labor participation rate we've seen since the Great Depression. So, John, how do you put this in perspective? Could, could you have ever imagined a shock like this? And with 20% unemployment and many businesses running out of, out of savings, how bad do you think this economic crisis is economically? The charts are striking, and uh, no, uh, who could have anticipated this? I certainly didn't. Not before this all began. I would say that uh, those of us who look at the numbers at a higher frequency note, there was a bit of improvement last uh, Friday. Uh, that unemployment number came down from 14.7 to 13.3, and we had a boost in employment to population too, but still the numbers are very high. And I think uh, what 
we need to do is understand what happened. It's This is not the virus itself. This is, I think, largely reactions to the virus, to the coronavirus. And uh, whether they were the best, uh, whether we can do better is a real question. But I think that the major impacts, and we'll go through this, is this is a lockdown. Lockdown didn't come from nowhere, of course, but this is the lockdown effects on the economy. And if you trace different sections, you know, look at consumption, look at investment, you can see the decline in GDP in this picture. Yeah, and continuing to think about what we're seeing, we all, as we all know, the Federal Reserve and Congress have responded incredibly quickly and with a lot of force, nearly three trillion in total fiscal and monetary stimulus. Let's talk a little bit about your views on the effectiveness of the response, both from a fiscal and monetary perspective. To start with, what would you have done differently? And on the fiscal side, how effective do you think $3 trillion of stimulus will be? And on the monetary side, in addition to taking rates down to zero, which is the first simple measure, maybe you can tell us about some of the novel programs the Fed created that you think will either be very effective or not, not so effective. So first on the fiscal side, you can see that in your chart on the left is a, a major uh, increase in the deficit. We had a deficit of a trillion dollars uh, per year going into this is now over three, three and a half. It's probably going to be higher. Uh, so it's huge spending and, uh, and, and tax reduction rebates. I think for the most part, this was focused on providing incentives for firms to hire, providing uh, gaps where they existed. I, I, one of the parts which I criticize and perhaps for that reason came in smaller than originally proposed was the cash payments to people, uh, $1,200 per person, 2,400 per couple. And that kind of thing didn't work uh, when we tried it before in the uh, previous financial crisis, uh, 2008, for example. And I think it's not working that well now. It's the people are saving the money and we'll see, it's obviously helping some people, but I think for the most part, this was a quick reaction. I think the paycheck, Paycheck Protection Program uh, was good, but um, it's it's good. The, the, the danger, of course, is the increase in debt. And I think it would be better if it was added to this some proposals for how we're going to undo this. I'm working on it myself. It's very important. It's not a front burner issue for many, but it's important to do. So the monetary side, uh, cutting the interest rates down close to zero, uh, that was the first thing they did. It made sense. And they rolled out a lot of programs. I think for the most part, they would be considered market opening, which is the correct way to proceed, try to keep markets open. Uh, the, the only part that I would uh, criticize is this time, unlike in the previous expansion in 2007, 8, 9, and afterwards, this is a huge increase in the money supply, M1 and M2, beyond the central bank assets. So I think some attention to that must be given. And in addition, parts of the program, the so-called Main Street lending part, are not really up and running yet. And it's an unusual activity for the Fed. Uh, if they can do that, uh, good for them, but it's very hard to do. Got it. And let's talk a little bit more on the monetary side. Um, I want to spend a minute on negative interest rates. There's about $9 trillion of negative yielding debt in the world, mostly in Europe and Japan. But we saw a week ago that the, the UK just issued its first ever sovereign bond with negative rates. And there's been some speculation that the US might follow, although Jay Powell seems to be rejecting that. First of all, what is the evidence so far from the experiment of negative interest rates in Europe and Japan? Will the US follow on a similar path? And if they did, would you be supportive of the use of negative interest rates? I don't think the experience has been that good in Europe or Japan. Uh, one of the problems is the negative rates uh, don't get passed through that much. They tend to be a squeeze on financial institutions on, and on banks. So the, it's not clear the lending is improved by that basis. Um, the US has not gone in that direction. It's you know, a quarter percentage point, but not negative. And uh, there has been talk recently, uh, there was talk in the previous episode, 2009 and 10, about negative rates. I don't think the Fed can do, will do that. I think Jay Powell is uh, speaking his mind about it. I think it's correct. It's, it's a different financial market. And I would like them instead to, 
to be more specific if possible about where rates are going to go. Uh, how long will they be zero? You can't, it's not rocket science, but I think there can be some improvement in the policy, not in a negative interest rate direction, because it's not clear how that would work. I think it could be, at this, with these financial institutions, it could be a negative, but to lay out where the rates likely to go in the future would be good. We could talk about that more. Got it. And one of the critical issues that all the stimulus is hoping to minimize is how much permanent damage will be done to the economy through corporations and households going bankrupt. I saw a recent survey of small business owners with businesses of less than 50 employees, and a third of them stated that they thought they would not be able to ultimately reopen. So how are you thinking about the level of bankruptcies coming and how that will ultimately impact the economy in the next year? Certainly the market doesn't seem to be very worried about this. No, I think that's right. I think I think the bankruptcies very much depends on how they work. Of course, a bankruptcy can be a, a workout. You know, you're too much lending, uh, too much borrowing has to be corrected. It can generally, you know, start from start over again. It can be a good thing, as you as you know very well. Um, so I think it's not the bankruptcies per se; it's how they're handled. I think what this chart does reflect is a real serious situation, especially for small businesses, especially for those that are specifically hurt by the lockdown the, and the airlines, leisure, et cetera, sports. And so we need to be thinking about how to help those industries in particular. But I think I wouldn't blame it on the bankruptcy. I think that's a symptom and it, it can work better. It could be a way to start. I, I sometimes worry that we don't have a good bankruptcy process for financial firms. There was a proposal I worked very hard on, uh, chapter 14 it was called, it never was quite passed. It was close. I think it would be a better situation if we had that kind of law for financial institutions now. Yeah. Just as an aside, you know, we we have mostly private companies in our portfolio at TPG, about 200 companies in our portfolio. And the private companies, whether they be small, medium, or even large, um, that have leverage and debt, they're under immense pressure because of that leverage and debt. And I think it's going to take a while for us to figure out how we provide the liquidity to those companies and what the lenders will be willing to do to forbear to the extent that we have businesses that even when they get to 70, 80 percent of last year's revenues, when you're down 20 or 30 percent on your revenues, it's really hard to make money. So that's going to be interesting to see how that process works over the next three to six months. Absolutely. Let's talk about the state and local governments as well. I mean, there's been so much focus on the generosity, if you will, of the federal government who has the ability to print money. But what about the effect on the state and local governments? It's estimated that there'll be over $200 billion of state and local deficits over the next year. And how is that going to flow through? Will the federal government find a way to bail the state's out as well, what levers can be used, and how do you think that will flow through over the next six, nine months? Well, I'm the view that the bailout mentality, if it's encouraged, can be actually damaging. And it would be better if the states uh, feel responsible for what they're doing. Now, of course, there are special cases and special situations which are unavoidable, but I think I think to some extent, the more the states can think about their budget, uh, and it's not just the state governments, of course, the local governments as well, the better off we'll be. So while there will be some assistance, there's no question about it, I think that has to be looked at carefully. And I wouldn't want to be in a situation where the states expect that. If 200 billion is a lot. Remember, the federal government's at three or, three or four trillion. Uh, deficit. So uh, let's see if we can work that out. And there are there is bankruptcy approaches for these governments, and uh, maybe that's the way we should think of it for the time being. Look for specific reasons, specific ways that federal government can help. Yeah, unfortunately, many of the state services, whether they be for health or for education or for basic essential services, unfortunately, those are the ones that are going to be squeezed with um, a lot of pressure on budgets. Right. Let's let's talk about the the reopening, uh, that current phase of the reopening, and we're reopening at a time when we're still experiencing a thousand deaths a day in the United States. This is very different 
than the reopening that occurred in China and Hong Kong, even Italy and Spain, where death rates were down very significantly when they reopened. Give us some insight into how we might think about the balance between the epidemi epidemiological challenge we have and the, the, human, the human health challenge we have versus the economic needs in deciding how to reopen the economy when we're still reporting 20,000 cases a day. And Jonathan, this is the biggest question to get right. Uh, I, don't, I don't think there's a trade-off necessarily. I think the things that work better for the economy are, are better for the health. That's the way I think about it. Yes, uh, there is going to be this, it may be a, a second wave, it could get worse before it gets better again. I think that what we want in the economy is to be ready for that, to be prepared. So I think it's promising that how, how we've responded already. For example, telemedicine is exploding like we've never seen it before. Uh, the use of uh, online sales, and that's the only positive number in the retail stairs report, retail sales report. I think the federal government as an executive order was issued May 19th, which is to encourage more of that. This requires some deregulation allow. This is the, for example, the uh, res restrictions on occupational licensing. That's a more state kind of thing. But the more that we can get the real economy moving and having the so-called shelter in place, uh, social distancing oriented to that will be better. Remember the, the lockdown itself, I think caused the damage. And to, to some extent, because we were so concerned about the health issues that was put to the side, it's gotta be more front and center now. And I would, I would encourage more of that. I think even you know, this, there's this decision about the Wayfair decision for the Supreme Court where we had to increase the tax on the internet compared to brick and mortar. Maybe we should put that on hold. I think there's a lot of things that we can do uh, to make this better, but they, they all of the type which were opening markets rather than closing markets. So that would be the mantra I would use. It's opening of markets in a wise, sensible way. And I could I think it could be a great benefit to the economy if we have that approach. Yeah, and flipping to the next slide, that leads into the question of, we're starting to see activities tick back um, pretty strongly actually. Uh, we have a couple of different health club facilities that in some states like Texas and Georgia, um, where members are just coming because they want to get back. They want to get back in the clubs working out. But you can see on this slide how, uh, how activity is starting to come back in the United States, and it compares it a little bit to how activity came back in China. Have you seen anything that you can learn from you know, Spain or China or Hong Kong that we can apply in, what are the learnings that we can apply to as we open, reopen the economy? So I think the most important thing is to recognize the private sector has a huge role here. You know, Facebook's talking about a new world where half the employees are working at home. I mentioned some of the innovations that are occurring. Uh, you have this very technology we're learning using now, Zoom. There's so much Zoom as we get Zoom fatigue. So I think the more that we can rely on the private sector to do some of this, the better off we're gonna be. We, didn't have, we don't have as much of that in other parts of the world as we have in, in this economy. And I think that's, that's the one thing I would stress that we can do better at. We already are doing better at, and uh, I'd encourage more of that. Yeah, great. Well, let's, let's talk about how the, the shape of the economic recovery, as we settle into fall, um, let's talk about that. You can see here, this is a forecast. These are Goldman's forecasts, which are 36% yeah. decline quarter over quarter in the second quarter that we're in now, then a huge recovery in the third quarter, up 29%. And based on that, when you run through that math, it says that by the end of the third quarter, GDP will be about at 80% of the levels that we were at before, which is still down 20% is down a huge amount on sort of a, a run rate basis. How are you thinking about where we're gonna be right before we enter the late fall, early winter flu seasons? Um, where do you think we'll be at that point in time? So I think this is, this is pretty reasonable. I would hope we, didn't, we don't have as much of a dip 
that suggested there. Uh, that's you know roughly 40% decline. Uh, that's still a forecast, of course. Uh, we're we're not uh, much into this time, but I'd say what we need to do with policy is to try to make that dip lower and have the recovery faster. I, I do think it's policy dependent, Jonathan. It's just not automatic. So the forecast here depends on certain kinds of opening, certain kinds of responses, certain kind of public policy. I think the more that this we can be clear about what the policy is, the better it will be. So this is a, you know, obviously it's just a forecast. It's contingent on policy. I hope it's better than this. And actually, as you as you go out into 2021, those are pretty high growth rates. <laughs> And it's still recovery. I think at that point, I want to be thinking about how we get back to growth that's higher than that miserable thing we have over uh, in the earlier part, which is growth around only 2%. That's what we need to have. And if we can you know, maybe use this as an opportunity to have the economy work better, more tax reform, more regulatory reform, more monetary reform, that would be the key. But I think if we're going to get a, a response like this, it very much depends on the policy. Yep, got it. And, you know, as I think about the timeline and my phases, that next phase, late fall, early winter, will be the phase when we have to worry about and think about what's going to happen with, uh, with the coronavirus again. Uh, I put up this chart of the 1918 Spanish flu, just as a reminder, it's a, it's a bit of a scary reminder, but just as a reminder, of how large these second waves can be. Now, of course, we've got therapeutics being developed. We've got social distancing that we're learning from. But as an economist, as you think about this unknown, how are you thinking about weighing that in your mind as to the economic prognosis? Um, because that's gonna be important for business leaders and CEOs and capital allocators to decide uh, how much CapEx they should spend. Yeah. Well, it certainly could be a revival like this. Uh, that's why the what's happening with respect to viral therapeutics and other kinds of controls and whatnot on the health are very important. But I think given that we as economists can't control much of that, we can have better uh, delivery of services so the risk is lower. But I think the thing is to be ready for this. And right now, we should be preparing for a, another. The, a, a, pandemics are not going to go away. How can we be more prepared And next time? Because your picture is a next time. I say one thing about these previous events, there wasn't much of an impact on the markets, stock markets. And that's true with the, the 57, 58 flu epidemic as well. And so it's an interesting thing. It suggests that there's, there's this terrible events can be handled in different ways. I'd like to find ways to make them make the markets respond in a more positive way. So that means being ready for it. We should be ready for another one. We should be getting ready now for another one. And that's that is to some extent. I, I'll go back to some of my themes. In California, we have this AB five, which is you know, restriction on different types of employment. We have uh, occupational licensing in all the states. I think there's good reasons to change those two to make the economy more resilient so that we can react better to these future events, which will be there for sure. Yeah, the shape of this, um, the economy and the forecasts is, is really interesting. We keep hearing things like Vs and Us and Ls I put up a chart, which is sort of my base case assumption. I call it the drunken W. Um, and it's really, you know, some recovery through the opening. And then I'm just assuming that there's some recurrence in, in the winter, hopefully not much of one, but some enough to give people a sense that, they, that they're going to pause. And then finally, once a vaccine comes through and herd immunity comes through, we can feel more comfortable and we can we can move forward with some real strength. But until then, a little bit of two steps forward, one step backward. Um, so that's kind of how I'm sort of thinking about it from an investor, investor's yeah. perspective. If we, if we fast forward to the next, uh, the next little section and talk about, okay, at some point we will have a vaccine, it will be widely adopted, whether that's 
you know, nine months, 12 months, 15 months, 18 months. There's lots of, there's lots of opinions on that, but at some point we'll have that and that'll become the new normal. And I want to talk through some of the potential long-term implications coming out of the crisis that will persist. Not, I'm not worrying about a year or two. I'm worrying about five years, 10 years, 15 years. So um, consumer behavior, as an example, we're starting to see uh, some green shoots on the on consumer behavior. Hotel stays are increasing, air flights are increasing off very, very low uh, troughs. I've observed in the past, in my 30 year career, that memories are pretty short. And while many of us swore that we wouldn't fly as much after September 11th, within a few years, we got right back to the same peak levels. And since then we've grown hugely from those levels of 2001. So what do you think will change more permanently coming out of this experience? Will it be flying? Will it be travel, live events, living in the city, office work? And how will the, this, this uh, crisis accelerate trends around more virtual and less physical? Yeah. What are the things that you see coming out of this? So I think, I think thinking that there's going to be a new normal is not the best way to think of it. I think this is like a continual change process we will be in as far as the eye can see. And uh, I think it involves certain things. And obviously, it would be less travel, more use of conversations like this. I think in certain areas, there'll be change in, in, in different directions. I'm involved in education. I can see it all over the place. We're you know, doing courses at Stanford or doing online courses all over the place. They could be much better. There's Zoom fatigue that occurs from that. So. I think all those services there can be better. I would like to see uh, improvements in online shopping. Um, the, a lot of firms are benefiting from that tremendously right now. Uh, I'd like to see more impact on travel. Maybe we don't have to go to so many meetings. Maybe there's other things we can do which will replace the travel to good locations or exotic locations. So I don't know. I don't think anybody knows except we can see how the technological changes since we've already begun are moving. I just give one quick example. I, five or six years ago, I developed an online course at Stanford and I thought it was really good. There was huge interest in it, but it sort of waned over time. Now suddenly there's a huge interest and all the students want this and it's there. And of course it now can get better. So I'm kind of optimistic. I don't, there's you know certain areas, K-12, we can talk a little bit about what we need to do to make that happen. But I think as a, as a continual change and it's kind of exciting, it's at least one piece of good aspects we can put in this terrible situation. Let's, um, let's move to the more macro level for a moment and talk about some of the scars that will be left after this crisis. You can see on these two charts um, an ever rising debt load not just in the government, but in, uh, in, in, corporate, in the corporate world as well as, as the household world. And you can see, as you talked about earlier, the level of uh, debt in the US economy, long-term debt in the US economy is extremely high. And one of the things when you step way back, the last 30, 35 years, I guess really since, since we broke the back of inflation in the early 80s when interest rates were double digit, We've gone from double digit interest rates to zero, 1% interest rates. And that was accompanied by massive amounts of debt that was taken on in all parts of the economy. And that fueled a lot of the growth that we've had over the last 30 years. Now we're at a point where rates can't go any lower. I guess they could go negative, but they can't go much lower. Debt is very high. So how do you think that this will, this is a problem that we've all been talking about for many years. And it seems like we've been able to avoid negative long-term effects. But what do you think about for the next 10 or 15, 20 years? Well, I'm not so sure we have been able to avoid the negative effects. So you know, we haven't had the greatest experience in the last 20 years. We had a deep recession before this one. We had slow, a very slow recovery from that. And uh, the debt is a trillion dollars uh, even before, the deficit's a trillion dollars even before going into this crisis. So I think there's still rooms to improve this to get so far, so-called fiscal house in order. What makes it hard, Jonathan, is these low rates. 
and they're good in many respects, but they also say, well, who cares about the debt? We've got these low rates. Let's just have negative rates. Don't have to worry about it. But I think it's important to put it a public policy in the place, which reduces this debt and at least the debt to GDP ratio in a sensible way. It doesn't require a lot of tax increases, spending control on certain areas which are growing too rapidly. I think we'd have a better economy in that respect. The private sector would do better. We'd have more investment, more productivity, and incomes per capita would grow more rapidly. So that's what I'd like to see. It's hard right now, both on the fiscal side and on the monetary side to get there. But uh, I think what should be happening, we should lay out plans, the Fed should lay out plans. Uh, even the Congress should be laying out plans of how we're going to undo this when the time is right. Do you subscribe to or give me your thoughts on what one of our one of one of your friends and our friends calls the secular stagnation theory that with all this debt and with low population growth and low productivity growth, all that's left is becoming like Europe or Japan over time. So the uh, secular stagnation has been uh, popularized by Larry Summers, actually a conference we jointly had with Brookings here. I've always been uh, suspicious and argued against that. I don't think the evidence is strong. Of course, we have the low interest rates and there's lots of reasons that that could exist. But I think the secular stagnation has this view that we're kind of stuck with low growth. We're stuck with low interest rates. I don't think that's true. I think with the right policy, we could have higher growth, not only in the United States. We also got literally billions of people around the world whose economies aren't growing so rapidly. So to me, we need to think about long-term certainly as a higher growth rate and per capita income uh, to deal with, make people's lives better. So the sector stagnation tends to move in the other direction. I don't like that. And then moving on to the monetary side, the chart that should be up is central bank assets, um, which have obviously grown six, seven X yeah. over the last 10 years. And with all this money being poured into the, the economy, not just the, the US, but the rest of the world, do you have any concerns that this could lead to longer term inflation? Or do we just have such weak demand and such good supply of everything that actually, no, the, the, the issue is more one of deflation? Right now, we don't have an inflation problem this minute. The unemployment is high, the state of the economy is low, but we always need to worry about that down the road. And so that's why I'd say a good monetary policy to me, a, a rule, rule-based rule policy where the interest rate is adjusted in a sensible way makes a lot of sense. When we had that in the past, the economy just hummed along and did very well. When other countries did that as well, so what I'd like to see is how we, when we unwind this situation, that we emphasize a more rules-based policy. I think that's what the, most people at the Fed would like to do, John Williams, Rich Clarida, Jay Powell, et cetera. And, and that's what I'd like to see. Now, what this means is we go back to a world where the interest rate, it's hard to believe this, Jonathan, the interest rate is determined by the supply and demand for reserves. We're so far away from that now. And there's debates about how, whether we'll ever get there. But that was a more market-determined rate. The central bank did not have a lot of extra instruments to use like they do now. I think it would be, we'd be better off going back to that. The economy would be better off. But again, it requires a lot of work, a lot of thinking, a lot of determination to make that happen. And, and following up on that a little bit, you know, we obviously we had the great financial crisis, which required a lot of new monetary approaches, including quantitative easing. We had a long period of repair and slow but positive growth. We got to the point at the end of 2019 where it seemed like the economy was starting to move in the right direction. And all of a sudden we had to decide that because of the little bit of a scare we had in the fourth quarter of 2000, um, sorry, 2018, that um, we actually had to start reducing rates again and now, of course, we have this, this crisis. How, how do you feel that are, we, are the monetary policy makers, um, are we all sort of too hooked on monetary policy? And, and what kind of distortion is it leading to? So I think in the years up until this recent event, there was a serious effort at the Fed 
to make the policy I would call more rules-based or predictable. The semi-annual report, which they put out, had whole sections on this. Uh, the leaders were talking about this. So I think that's where they would like to do. This has changed that. It may change the politics as well. The Fed is, is less independent because of this than it otherwise would be. So that's the pressures that you see. And I think it's 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 not generally good. We we have had good experience when the Fed has worked in good situations, but that's not where we are now. It's a different circumstance, but I'd like to see it get back to that. And there is a, this artificial stimulus, quite frankly, you're, I think you, you use that term. And we don't want artificial stimulus. We want the real economy, we want growth, we want productivity, we want something that's more permanent rather than these a short-term uh, effect. So that's that's where I would go. I think uh, some of the Fed would like to go that way. It's, there's a huge debate, actually, the huge debate about the role of government after this. And uh, it, this is changing. Obviously, the, the lockdowns, the changes in government policy has have changed things a lot. I, I thought that the tax changes in 2017, I thought the regulatory changes in 2017, 2018 were going in the right direction. I think the fiscal side would still need to be corrected to be sure, but um, I would like to get back to that. In fact, this to me is another reason to be trying to do that rather than just think about a, a more centralized approach to the economy. But the, there will be a huge debate about it and uh, we should have our, our uh, facts and our arguments straight so that people can make the right decisions. Let's talk about globalism a little bit here. Um, chart on global trade shows that after many, many years after World War II, uh, global trade was up and to the right uh, inextric inextricably. Since the great financial crisis, actually global trade has been pretty flat. And it seems like this crisis will exacerbate the recent trends towards anti-globalism, towards nationalism, um, maybe there's fewer exports, fewer imports, more domestically focused economies all around the world. If so, what are the implications for that, for growth, for productivity, for standards of living? What does this COVID crisis mean for that change in globalism and nationalism that we're, we've been seeing over the last 10 years? I think the, the most obvious thing is concerns about these global supply chains. Or people are concerned about, oh, the medicine is produced in China or India. We can't get it. We need it. We need to produce in America. So that's uh, against globalization, obviously. It also would reduce costs. I, I think we need to be very careful about this. Obviously, we want there are security issues. The, the one uh, I remember many, many years arguing that we, some people said we, we, um, need to have a textile business in the United States because we'd have to make uniforms for the military. It's a national security problem. We don't have tech. So I remember combating that argument. We don't want to get in that kind of silly notion again. So it, it requires a serious discussion. But I would, I would like to see, and, and by the way, this goes back to what was happening before this crisis. There was a uh, concern about trade restrictions. I remember uh, one of the, the meetings, uh, President Trump led a, read a uh, email message he got from Elon Musk saying that when I export a Tesla to China, I have to pay a 25% tariff. When a car comes to the US from China, it's 2.5. That's not fair. Do something about this. Well, 25, 2.5 does sound unbalanced, is unbalanced. So we need to address that. And I mean, I think zero for zero would be a great policy. You have a zero tariff, well, have a zero tariff. So. I hope we can get back to that, but I think this, after this experience, the global supply chain will be a tough issue, and we need to con consider it very sensibly and recognize that the, there are cost reductions from globalization. And let's finish our discussion today on perhaps the most defining social, economic, and political issue that we've been facing, not just recently, but over the last decade, the sharp rise of inequality, and how the COVID crisis affects that, perhaps later on top of that, um, the current events that we're seeing with respect to race, race relations, inequality that we're experiencing all over the country. So what are the social, economic, and political implications of what this crisis, sort of the combination of the COVID crisis 
and the, the crisis that we're all experiencing around the country right now on, on, on race, what are the implications for that on the November elections, economic policies that come out of the November elections? How are you thinking about that? It's a, it's a very important issue. I think what the crisis has done is made it, it clear there are some real inequities, racial inequities in this country. And part of it is uh, specific reasons where people live. I think the, the, the very effect of the lockdowns has impacted people with lower incomes more than people with higher incomes. I think what this is going to do, and I hope so, is make people try to fix this problem. We have a homeless problem that's been terrible. Maybe this has made it clear how terrible that problem is. Let's try to do something about it. I think in education, which I'm obviously interested in, we don't have a very equal K-12 education system in the United States. You could argue that's part of the problem. Maybe this will bring attention. Let's let's deal with that. Let's try to have a better grade schools, high schools in, in the tough areas, the tough areas of this country. Let's have more opportunity. So I, I think this is a very serious issue. Uh, again, it's laying bare to some issues that were there already. I, I think in the case of education, we know how to reform that. I think I know how to reform it, but it takes a lot of will, a lot of dedication, and maybe this will bring it about. I hope it goes in the right direction, not in the wrong direction, because because I think that's what the issue is. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Uh, hopefully this uh, discussion was informative so far. Um, there should be an ability for folks to ask questions that are coming into me by email. I've got a series of questions that are kind of coming into my email. Let me just start. We've got about 15, 20 minutes to go through some of these. Um, one thing we didn't talk about, which is one of the questions on people's minds, um, re relates to the U.S.-China relationship and how that's evolving and changing. And again, what are the longer term implications of what's happening between US and China right now? Well, one of the areas is trade and uh, the other area is what kind of system we want. I think at this point, um, go back to the supply chain issue, we have to concern, be concerned about security issues in the supply chain of certain goods. And so hopefully that will move in a constructive direction. I think there's, uh, Emphasis now on restricting trade, maybe to China, maybe to other countries as well. I think that's probably in the wrong direction, but a find a ways to be opening trade, looking for things which we have mutual interest in. But it's harder than ever. Um, I think I would step back and say, I think the danger going forward is that there's going to be look for solutions which are more government uh, oriented. And uh, you know, the system of uh, in China is much different than the system in the United States. And people say, oh, China got rid of the disease really quickly. Maybe we should go back to that. Well, I think that was, that's a terrible mistake. So I would say what the, the creativity that's going on here. I think some of the, in, the ingenuity, the use of Zoom is just amazing itself. Uh, I was, that's now led by a person who was born in China, he lives in the United States. So uh, I think the more that we have these exchanges, the better. I, I don't think it's necessarily that you need to have globalization per se, but it's because there's so much gains from that in the right way. So US China is one example, but there's many others. One of the questions relates to um, how this crisis is gonna differentially impact um, emerging market countries, lesser developed economies. I'm going to use the example of, of India as an example, where India was was late to have the to have the virus show up. Um, they quickly had a shutdown of three to four weeks, but now are opening the economy again while the virus is still growing and 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 uh, and sort of raging. How do you think this is going to play out, whether it be for India or for Brazil or for South Africa or for Nigeria? What's going to happen to those lesser developed countries and what can they be doing right now to make sure that a worst case scenario doesn't uh, come to be? The problems are, are growing in Brazil and they will grow in India, my, my guess is. 
And so that's uh, an area of concern. I think there's immigration issues which are gonna be caused by that, which we need to think about. But the, uh, the it's the same disease. It's the same treatment. It's the hope that we'll get a vaccine or get some kind of therapeutic. I think here, the international organizations, the World Bank, IMF, are important to even the United Nations to keep track of. There's a way that there can be interaction between the countries that are beneficial. World Health Organization gets a huge amount of criticism right now, but I think I've always thought that the international organizations can play a role in this case. It could be debt forgiveness. It could be aid to particular people. It could be ways that you, you channel private sector uh, in the right way. It could be remittances, make sure the remittances don't fall off too much to Mexico or to Brazil or wherever it happens to be. So this is an area which is the most difficult. Uh, we are naturally not paying as much attention to that as we are paying attention to what's happened to each country. But if you, you know, we could be optimistic about some changes here, stock market, et cetera, but globally, it's still a huge issue. And then we need to think about that for sure. I'm jumping around a little bit because the questions, you know, are covering a broad range of topics. So this one's a very specific one, which is, um, it seems like particularly um, on the, the democratic side, uh, side of the equation, that there is a inevitability about raising taxes again in order to take care of um, the liabilities we have. Uh, this is a very specific question. If you, it, how do you think about the trade-off and what would your choices be between increasing taxes or reducing public spending? Well, I think at this point, if you look at the budget uh, and why it has been increased even before this, it's really certain types of programs, uh, health programs are growing very rapidly. And so that's what I would focus on. I don't see the tax increases as dealing with that. Moreover, my view is that tax increases are detrimental to increasing growth. Obviously, you have to have taxes to su support government spending and many other things. But I think the, for the most part, what we should be looking for is ways to have tax reform, not to increase. I'd like to see a policy where, hey, we're not going to increase taxes. At least go that far. We're not going to increase taxes for the foreseeable future. That means we don't we, we keep the expensing in place. We keep the recent tax reform in place. I think that would be a boon to the economy. Obviously, there's people on the other side. I think if they look at the numbers, they'll see that the, the way to deal with the deficit and the debt, which we need to, is this by slowing the growth. It's, it's slowing the growth of spending. And that should do the trick. But a huge communication issue, very important to get right if we can. One related point on that is the state pension liabilities, which we all know have already been under a lot of pressure. Many states are unfunded or under underfunded. It's particularly difficult to um, to service your, your liabilities, which are growing with your retirees at six, seven, eight percent with interest rates so low. Do you have any thoughts on coming out of this crisis, what we might do to um, help avoid what will be now an aggravated position of states like California and Illinois and New Jersey, where, where there are state pension issues that are gonna get very, very difficult? I don't think the problem is different now than before the crisis. We had the same thing before. Maybe interest rates will be lower for longer, but, it's, uh, but the same issue needs to be addressed. It's, it's really bringing the pension promises down to closer to reality. Uh, we've been working on it for a while. It's, it's state governments, it's local governments. There's been some changes in some of the local governments in California, which seem promising. We'll have to get back to that. But I think it's important to keep that separate from the other issues that the, the pandemic is causing. Those are kind of separate issues which need to be addressed anyway. It's like an ongoing problem and we need to address it. But the, the, the solutions are not rocket science. They're just trying to bring the spending into, into alignment with the income that's coming to pay for the pensions. Um, I've got one more question for you, which I'll pose and uh, you can think about it, but I'll make a couple comments on what we're seeing in our companies around the world. The question for you to think about is, 
what are the um, what are the rays of sunshine? What are the things that you think that will come out of this crisis? Like all crises and like all adversity, um, positivity can come out of it when you when we both learn from it and we focus on making changes. So, what are the things that you're feeling like optimistic that are going to come out of this that are positive? Because this is such a difficult time for so many people. While you think about that, and then we'll we'll wrap up. Um, from our perspective, as I said, we have about 200 companies all around the world, everything from small businesses, venture businesses, to large businesses, everywhere from the United States to we have two businesses in Myanmar. Uh, we have a cell tower business in Myanmar, um, and we actually have a, uh, a food business in, in Myanmar. And what's been amazing to, to us is the incredible speed of response by most commercial enter enterprises has been incredibly strong, thoughtful, targeted. It's a challenge that one of the things that businesses have had to do is take employment levels down and, and rely on the government to step in to help on the employment side. And one of the things we were talking about before this um, was that in some countries, uh, what they've done is they've had a moratorium on financial obligations on paying your debt because it's very difficult if you're if you're a landlord if, if you're a retailer and you've got to pay debt you've got to pay your landlord well if you don't pay your landlord then the landlord can't pay its its debt off and the, the lenders are coming down and saying you owe me my interest you owe me my principal so some countries like India have actually put a moratorium on uh, all financial obligations. In this country, we haven't done that. And that's actually going to cause many bankruptcies that otherwise might not have been caused. But we're trying to find the right balance between how much the government helps out and how much corporations and organizations help out. I would say that I've been very impressed by how quick, how quickly and, and how thoughtfully most organizations have, to, have had to deal with a crisis where they could never imagine, and you can't build a business for revenues down 90% or revenues down 50%. You just can't build that. So it's been interesting to see the um, businesses, how they responded. It's been really interesting to see how governments have responded from our government here in the United States, how it's a little bit different in Germany and France and China and other places. But in general, I would say the resilience of both people and businesses has been very encouraging. It reminds you that you know this too shall pass, whether it be in six months, nine months, or 18 months, this too shall pass. And if we can minimize the damage along the way, we'll come out of this and we'll get back to where we were. It might take a year or two, but we'll come back to where we were. And hopefully from this, we can learn some lessons and we can put some new safeguards in, just like we all did after the great financial crisis. So with that, let me go back to the question, which is, what are the uh, the glimmers of positivity that you're seeing? I think you just named it. It's it's what people are doing to solve this problem and uh, to let them do that, not to constrain them from doing that. It's it's uh, to me very reassuring. It's easy to get pessimistic when you see uh, schools are closed and shops are closed and restaurants are closed, but it's easy to get optimistic when you see the technology it's being used in different ways. I could have never dreamed it being used. Half of Facebook's going to work online, or what? it's just an incredible change. And I don't think that's—I don't think it's like a new normal. I don't want to get back to where we were. I want to get to better. I want to get growth three or four percent. I don't want this one or two percent. And I want it to be—I want it to help the rest of the people in the world. So it's—it's. It's, uh, I think you pointed to it, though, Jonathan. It's—it's it's these things that are happening. That, and I wish you'd get out there and talk about it more. I think you have lots of good information that it's uh, it gets it gets hidden by our our partisanship and, and the degrees we're debating bigger issues. So thanks for saying those things. Yeah, well, it's clear that the human spirit is very resilient. It's very creative. Uh, it's very energetic. And uh, this too shall pass. And the world has seen much tougher times. Uh, you know, like in World War II that we've all gotten through. So we'll get through this one as well. Dr. Taylor, thanks so much for the conversation today. Um, there's just so much to learn during this time and it's great to have a scholar uh, that's as experienced as you to help us think through these things. Thank you so much. Thank you.
been great. Okay, take care. Thank you.